You want to mute? He is an author in their element, having some fun with their karate, delivering some of the best combat scenes I've read tale lately. That never wanders far from my mind. I think that this might be one of the single best representations of dragons that I've read in the fantasy genre. This book is a dark, fascinating, disgusting, wonderful, nauseating, intriguing, effed up, heartfelt, brutal character study. And it recaptures the magic of far-flung galaxies, grand ideas, and more. There's so much this book gets right. Like any good map, you're aware of the destination it's leading you towards. But the way it takes you there is very pretty indeed. An all-consuming dreamscape, the lights of Poe Morpheus. It's a neo-retro-futuristic fest. This is guns that go star. All right, uh, welcome. Uh, this is a military sci-fi panel. I am your host, Michael Mame. I'm the author of the Planet Side series and uh, some various other books, The Misfit Soldier. Uh, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves, and then we'll just jump right into talking everything military science fiction. All right. I noticed uh, before before we start the introductions, you no, know, that was pretty pretty well done there, Jenny. Having your book right in the middle of the video right there at the end, that was pretty well pretty well set up. <laughs> yeah, it was surprising. I was like, oh, it's my book. <laughs> that was that was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah I don't cool. know how much you pay them to do that. That was great. All I, right, I so no I'm idea. gonna I'm gonna start uh, with uh, KB and then kind of go around clockwise. Excellent. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's light evening, depending on where you are. Um, I am KB Wagers. I am a sci-fi author, um, currently of the military science fiction series, The Neo G Adventures, uh, which is based off the real life missions of the US Coast Guard, follows the interceptor crew Zuma's ghost and involves a whole host of shenanigans and also some rather uh, strange and inventive sporting events, which is not something I ever thought I would say that I was writing about. Okay, Jack. I'm, uh, my real name is John Hamray, but I write under the pen name Jack Campbell. I'm a retired Navy with uh, surface warfare, intelligence, and a number of other things. Uh, most well known for my Lost Fleet series, uh, which classic space opera done in a new way. Um, also, uh, Steampunk with Dragons series, uh, Pillars of Reality. Um, I'm happy to be here and looking forward to the chat. Great. Thank you. Craig? Uh, Craig Allenson. My real name is Craig O'Dell. Um, Jack, you're one of the reasons I became a writer, so so thrilled to meet you. <laughs> I met you at Dragon Con, too. So um, I write a military sci-fi space opera series called Expeditionary Force, Near Future Military Sci-Fi. Um, and I'm now writing a sort of urban fantasy series. Okay, Zach. Hi, um, I'm Zach Topping. My real name is Zach Topping. Um, I'm a military sci-fi writer. My debut near future military thriller, Wake of War, just published last summer from Forge Books. And it's about a second American civil war in the year 2037 and the trials and tribulations of those who are caught up in the fighting. Um, I'm a former U S army soldier and a current career firefighter. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, I'm JS Dewis. Uh, you can call me Jenny. Uh, my debut um, series is the last watch in the exiled fleet, the divide series. It is space opera, military sci-fi. We call it, um, Night's Watch from Game of Thrones meets Get Battlestar Galactica at the edge of the universe. So, um, And then my third book, which is not in that series, uh, Rubicon, comes out in March. It is more sh of a s straight military sci-fi than the other one, but still kind of in the same same vein as those. And my day job, I write um, for AAA video games. So that is what I'm doing now. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's great. All right. I'm going to just jump right into questions and uh, and we'll kind of just see where we go and we'll take it from there. Um, Jack, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, you've probably been doing this longer than than most of us, all of us, probably. Does it say. show? Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But I've read your books like 
I don't know, a couple decades ago. So I feel like I feel like I've known you that long, which is absolutely not true. Um, but you, Stark's War came out in 2000, which is, uh, goodness, 23 years ago. And uh, Dauntless, uh, the first book that I read of yours, uh, came out in 2006, which is, you know, the first book in the original Blackjack Geary uh, Lost Fleet for those who are watching. Um, and for my money, the best, best, Navy, best Space Navy book ever written. Uh, and uh, still holds up today, right? So, uh, th th and that's what I really want to want to ask you: is how? how how does it hold up? You know, twenty years later, when so much sci-fi doesn't, um, you know, what what is what, what's universal or about military sci-fi where where you know it still holds up today? I think there are three primary elements: um, timelessness. One thing is the military is always getting new tools. And so, you know, military SF is looking, what are the new tools going to be? Uh, and yet it's the same old jobs. How are these new tools going to impact your new jobs? So we're always thinking of that, uh, excuse me, new tools impact the old jobs. So we're always trying to think about that and trying to see where things are going. But an aspect that doesn't change is also timeless, and that's the people, the sacrifices they make, the prices they pay. Um, the decisions that have to be made, the things they have to do, and the times when they have to go beyond what anyone should be expected to do. Um, that's a timeless element. And as long as you keep your focus of your story on those people, I think that will remain timeless. And finally, I think it's important to include the element of chance, the, the uncertainty of what's going to happen. Um, history tells us that the best plans, the best people, the best weapons don't guarantee victory. Human choices and actions have a huge impact, no matter how advanced the technology, and military SF will remind us of that, uh, as well as reminding the senior officers of the military who, you know, they often get obsessed with having the latest high-tech gizmos and don't pay enough attention to the importance of the people who are going to be operating those gizmos, and uh, hopefully we can remind them of, of the importance of the people. So I, I think those are the three primary elements. Yeah, great. Open it up to anybody else. Time, timeless well, elements. Move Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I think Jack hit on it. It's the shared experiences, whether it's a historical war or a future war or present war. A lot of those experiences, the camaraderie, the values that you learn when faced with adversity kind of uh, transcend time, if you will, and follow us through whatever you know, genre we're writing in or exploring. And, and for us, that happens to be military sci-fi. But yeah, definitely the, the shared experiences. With, and, and that's all about the people and the characters. Yeah. For me, for me, um, something, and the reason that I, I, when I was asked to put this panel together, the reason I asked each of you to be on this panel is because the thing, the one thing that all of you do extremely well is the relationships between the people in the military and how they interact with each other. Cause there's a way, right? There's a language that they have. There's a common bond that they have from shared experience that, you know, that I experienced in real life and all of you have captured in your work. And I think that's why I enjoyed the books that all of you've written. Cause that's what, that's the first thing that makes me turn a, you know, I'll stop reading. If the characters, don't talk to each other the way that soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines talk to each other, uh, then, then I have to turn it off, right? If there's an Air Force and a Marine guy in the same room and they aren't giving each other crap, I'm not reading it because it's just not going to, that's just not real, right? <laughs> Any other timeless stuff anyone want to talk about? Or I can go on to the next thing we got. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give this question first uh, to uh, Jenny, JS. Um, so your divide series, and you you talked about it in your introduction, not exactly military sci-fi, kind of, right? It's like you said, last watch on the on the outside of the galaxy, which I think is a perfect perfect description description of it. Um, they're they're out there on on the wall watching the void, um, but it does have a very military feel to it, even though most people would call it space opera, right? Um, where do you think the line is? You know, how, how do you define military sci-fi versus space opera? And I think it was it was neat that uh, actually in Jack's intro, he he mentioned that that the uh, his his uh, Lost Fleet series is uh, 
is space opera. And I'm going to come to you on that in a little bit here, Jack, um, because I, I always thought it was mill sci-fi. I kind of felt like it was mill sci-fi. It centers around the military. Um, and, and Jenny, I'll just throw that out to you. Yeah, it's a really good question that I don't actually have an answer to, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, I feel like it's, for me, it's a lot, It it's about the protagonists. Are they in the military? Like, that's really the main one for me. And like, I think you can start to say, okay, it's definitely military sci-fi if that's the case. And then there's a lot of other like smaller factors, themes of, you know, technology, we kind of talked about them, technology, war, weapons, um, adventure, action, and then maybe getting into some diplomacy and politics, but maybe that's where it starts pushing into more of the space opera land. Um, if it starts focusing on that bigger picture versus the more the smaller conflicts. But I also know that there are things that are military sci-fi that are about the bigger conflicts. So it's like, I don't know where that line <laughs> is really. Um, but for me, you know, military sci-fi, like the thing that really introduced me to that was Battlestar Galactica. So that's kind of my framework for what I consider military sci-fi. And I think a lot of people would maybe call that, you know, maybe not space opera, but just science fiction adventure or something with military themes. So I think it's just different for different people and what you're, you know, what you've consumed in the media and what you're bringing to the table from your life experience. You know, I'm not from the military, um, but, you know, I have life experiences that, you know, I can kind of relate to like you were talking about where you're kind of like all that camaraderie and how you talk to each other, like on film sets, like that's kind of how we are too. Like we kind of like have that, like giving each other shit kind of thing. And you're like on set 20 hours a day, like killing yourself for something. And, you know, that's kind of how I like imagine my characters and like kind of trying to relate to that military experience, even though I don't have that in my background, but that's, I think, you know, it, it's hard to define basically. <laughs> Oh, I, think I would agree. Yeah. Oh. I would agree that I, I, got, a comment here. I got a comment here. Um, I, I would I would describe the Lost Fleet as space opera, um, and, and I love that series. I would describe it as space opera because a lot of military sci-fi tends to be small unit actions. You know, a desperate band of uh, a platoon, you know, fighting a desperate battle. But Lost Fleet has more of an epic scope to it. And Blackjack Geary has to not only, you know, be a brilliant uh, strategist and techni technician, he has to get people to follow him. And that's, we call it leadership, but it's also politics. And, you know, th that's to me the, the epic scope of the story that it's not just one battle after another, and it's not just small unit action. That's the difference between military sci-fi and space opera. They bleed into each other, but, you have a lot of uh, books that are just, you know, some mercenaries fighting a battle on a planet. That's not space opera. That that truly is military sci-fi. And Lost Fleet, you know, also the the copycats, Black Fleet, um, you know, Christopher Nuttall's Ark Royal, all the ones that came after Jack um, are space opera because of the scope of the stories. That's okay. my two cents. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I, just for I apologize, everybody. I kind of uh, forgot to unmute as I was trying to tell say who to speak. So we ended up with two people speaking over each other. That was absolutely my fault and not theirs. KB, you had something you wanted to say. Oh, I just I, I mean, I think I agree with Craig, too. He sort of said some of what I was going to say anyway. So um, that you're you're looking at a. a a situation where where that stuff really does bleed into each other but often the the designators for what is space opera versus what is going to be military sci-fi revolves around the people involved in the scenarios and like what the scenarios are themselves like jenny said where you know politically if you're if you're delving into like huge political things you often are going to bleed more into the space opera arena um you know, unless you're like actually focused on something that's revolutionary or, um, you know, directly tied to politics and the military, which is not unheard of. So, yeah, I think it's kind of it's hard to divorce politics in the military sometimes. Like one of the if, if you ask, you know, if you ask a bunch of people who've read mill sci-fi for a long time, like give me your your Mount Rushmore of, of sci-fi military sci-fi books. Right. One that's going to come up a lot is going to be uh, Joe Haldeman, right? That's going to, you know, the forever war is going to come up a lot. 
And that is nothing but political. Now, it's 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 political that's metaphorical in a lot of cases. And, you know, I mean, he's he's writing about the Vietnam War. Um, but 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 it is political, um, even though the characters themselves aren't really involved in politics as much as they are in, in the war. But, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I had uh, one of my deciding things is. I think space opera tends to focus uh, very much on the individual actions, the lone wolf character who's getting everything done by themselves. And whereas I tend to think that real military SF focuses on the team, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the crew of the ship or the, the small unit or whatever, but it's not just one person who's accomplishing these things. It's the efforts of the group working together that ultimately uh, make the difference. And to me, that's one of the big differences that space opera can just be, Hey, this one guy call him Luke Skywalker. He's going to win the war all by himself. Um, but, uh, good military SF will show that there's a squad backing up Luke and they're, they're keeping people off his back and the people preparing the aircraft and everything. It's all, all part of a group who gets the job done. So you're saying like Mandalorian space opera, uh, Andor is military sci-fi. Yeah, you could Dora. say that. Yeah. It, yeah, except Andor it, isn't Andor really is about a military action. Yeah, except. I mean, yeah. there's not really, I mean, there's a couple battles, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that there's, a bit, well, the Empire's there, but. Um, are, there, are there tropes or specific things that you have to have for it to be called military science fiction. And if you don't have to have it, are there things that we do see all the time? Or, you know, if you see this, it probably is military science fiction. Well, according to you, Michael, unless there's a group of uh, enlisted who are brewing booze in the back of the ship, it's not military sci-fi. Well, it's not realistic military sci-fi. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that 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 is true. Um, <laughs> That, that is, if somebody's not brewing alcohol somewhere or, or can get it somewhere, yeah, it's not real. But okay, that's so that's one trope. <laughs> Great. Anybody else? Uh, well, yeah, I go mean, ahead, Zach. Go ahead, Zach. obviously, um, it, it doesn't need to have tropes, they don't have to exist, but they do exist, uh, for a purpose, maybe for a reason, like the uh, the grizzled, you know, non com the senior NCO yelling at the privates brewing, you know, you know, toilet wine in their hooches. And as they're supposed to be getting ready for that larger action, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but again, you know, it serves a purpose. The tropes serve a purpose and they kind of, if done right, they can really help zero in the direction the story is trying to go, you know, um, Obviously, there's lots of benefit. Um, you know, the, the war is bad and violence is permanent. And, you know, usually there's a politician or an evil corporation at the top who are benefiting while those who are fighting are suffering. Uh, but those are tropes uh, because they're grounded in some sense of reality or some sense of, of actual, um, you know, instigating events that lead nations or entities into military actions in the first place. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, there's a a trope which I think is is realistic that there tends to be. Uh, usually, it's a senior enlisted, you know, the gunny or the chief. Something's broken, uh, can't be fixed. Get this person in there; they'll get it done. Uh, we can't find this particular thing. Uh, it's not in the supply system. Uh, the chief will find it. Just don't ask any questions where he got it. Um, that's a thing you see in a lot, and it, it's based on reality. That's that's a big part of how things work. The uh, uh, the senior enlisted doing it, and you know, in the original Star Trek, you had Scotty. You know, he's going to make those engines work, even if it's impossible. Um, they, they, I think, when it doesn't work is when they get away from that, and the officers know everything. <laughs> and the, the most uh, proficient technical person on the ship is the captain instead of uh, the chief petty officers. Uh, so that's kind of the reverse trope, which uh, I, I think really destroys any uh, believability, at least for me. Right. Like the trope can become a caricature or, or a parody more so than, you know, helping 
you know elevate the the topic or the point of the story yeah the the young officer who can't find who can't read a map that 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 trope could die for all i care it's been done so many times the uh plus nobody uses maps anymore the um (laughs) other things universal tropes um i think there's some things that i'm hesitant to say you know they can't exist outside of military sci-fi at all but you know, like the clone army or the robot army kind of things um, is one that, you know, I tend to think of or just in general kind of the big weapons like the crazy WMDs, like science fiction, like themed kind of ones, I think are a trope that, you know, I think of and just like a super soldier space marine style thing. Like I think of Warhammer 40k style, like excessive <laughs> Um, weaponry type stuff is one that I think of that I would think most for the most part is going to exist in a military sci-fi story. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think once you put mechs in there, it's probably military sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got one more. Sorry. I didn't Go mean. ahead. Yeah, that's uh, all right. I was just thinking about um, it's more of a, a theme that that comes up a lot is uh, colonialization and xenophobia um, in military sci-fi. You know, you've got the 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 race of human beings uh, storming an alien planet or something, you know, and that's, I think it's a, you know, it's something you see and it's, it's obviously a, not a thinly veiled analogy for sort of that tribalistic um, patriotic or loyalty or country mentality, but it's definitely something that you see uh, more so in the past. I think it's starting to change a little bit due to the way we see things and the way, wars are fought and the things that wars are fought over now. Uh, I don't think that means it's gone forever, but uh, that's just one more thing that you, that's a common thread through a lot of uh, military sci-fi. Yeah. I'm going to table that for just a minute because uh, we are going to come back to that. And I think in a pretty big way, because um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, military sci-fi and how it's changed. Um, and so I will get us back onto that topic here momentarily. Um, let me go to KB. Um, speaking of things that are changing in military sci-fi, Right. I don't I don't think I don't think the Neo G series exists 20 years ago. I don't honestly think it exists 10 years ago. Um, and, and to the point where I read it the first time, I was pretty surprised it existed then. And that was pretty cool. Um, it's uh, so. Um, yeah. Do you think the genre is evolving? I mean, it, it you, you would be evidence of that. I think you could probably find counter evidence. Uh, do you think the genre is evolving? And if so, is that good? I well, I obviously it's good, and I, I mean, from my perspective, I'm sure there are people out there who would argue that it's not good <laughs> that we're that we're destroying something sacred. But um, you know, I I think it is evolving. I'm I'm doing what I can to drag some of it kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Uh, but I, I think that there's plenty out there in the independent um, published arena that like folks who have been doing this for a lot longer than I have. Um, as we know, trad publishing is, is sometimes a little bit slower. Um, and I, I distinctly remember um, when, when my editor, David Pomerico, approached me about doing this project, um, you know, we had a conversation about how generally conservative military science fiction readership is. Um, and I'm a, a stubborn person. So I was like, okay, what you're saying is we should make this super queer and super intersectional, uh, um, intersectional and super diverse. And, um, you know, I'm just going to throw everything possible onto the page and we'll see what shakes out in the end as far as the story goes. Um, and I'd like to think that we put together a pretty good crew. Uh, the Neo G series is set in near future Earth, um, about 24th century, um, that has survived a what what is called the collapse, um, uh, which is basically social, political, uh, economic, and climate breakdown on Earth that uh, nearly wiped humanity out. And then we spent about 400 years clawing our way back from the brink. Um, And we inhabit the inner solar system and 
couple of the planets on Trappist. Um, but yeah, the focus is a lot on the characters and, and who they are. Um, people live their lives without having to deal with a lot of the bullshit that we do have to deal with now. Um, oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. I really shouldn't have cussed, huh? Uh, <laughs> like, it's a military science fiction battle. I don't know yeah, it's, it's a military sci-fi. That's another thing I will never believe about your military sci-fi book. If they don't, If they don't swear, it's not real. Somebody, somebody, yeah. <laughs> Why are there so many curse words in this? And I'm like, well, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so yeah, it's just, I basically wrote a world that I would love to see come into existence, um, minus the collapse portion of things, which if we could stop doing that, uh, that would be great. Um, that was one of those side notes. I got an email from somebody who was like, thanks for talking about the pandemic. And I'm like, I wrote that book almost a year before the pandemic happened. I was kind of hoping it wouldn't happen. <laughs> and here we are. Um, so yeah, I, I do think, uh, I think we're going to see a lot more and there are some uh, others in trad publishing. Um, there's a great book called Iron Curtain, uh, Iron as in Iron Cannon um, by Anya Ow. Um, which is like a, mm, it's like a spy military thriller um, that is Russian based and it is absolutely excellent. Uh, and then uh, Ren Hutchings' um, Under Fortunate Stars is like military science fiction adjacent because the crew of, it's like a research corporate ship, but they're sort of run as a military ship. Um, and that's got one of my favorite time travel paradoxes but that's, both a good, of them, that's a good book yeah they both do a really good job with that same sort of like there's just a really good set of characters that are more representative of what the world looks like um than you know our traditional let's send a straight white guy to space military science fiction all right so i'm gonna throw that out to anybody um what, what do we think the next 10 years of military sci-fi look like? You know, what, what are we going to see? Is it going to be more of the same? Where, you know, where's it going that's different than, you know, than that's different? We talked in the last question kind of about, you know, tropes that are common. What, what are we going to see that, you know, people haven't done before or, or they haven't done much of? Wow. Well, I'm I'll jump in. Um, yeah. I think in great part, it depends upon what the next war is going to be like. I'm assuming there's going to be another one. Uh, you look at the long cycle of military SF and, and you know, the first wave, you had these uh, people who had served prior to World War II or in World War II, and you've got their kind of all-out war stories. And then you have uh, the people who went through Korea, the people who went through Vietnam, uh, people like Joe Haldeman. And their stories tended to be much more um, nuanced, uh, cynical, uh, assuming the system was going to screw you, not assuming the war was uh, necessarily just or right. Um, then you had the later Cold War people, uh, which were yeah, a little more yeah, really gung-ho in some cases. Um, and then you've got the, the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan writing now. And unfortunately, their writing tends to be a lot like those of people who are in Vietnam. Uh, that, you know, when you have a, a war like that, it tends to produce uh, people with uh, uh, perspective reflecting their experiences. So I think the next war is going to make quite a difference, um, whether it's, it's a well run or not. Uh, Ukraine, for example, may make a big difference in, in the stories that are told in the future. Uh, but I also think that um, it's going to continue uh, looking ahead rather than rigidly. You know, the original Star Trek series, you had them saying uh, in the 24th century, women can't command starships. They're just not suited for it. Uh, and uh, in this real world, we've already had women commanding carrier battle groups. So uh it tended to be way behind the power curve when it came to changes that were going to happen um and so i think trying to foresee those social changes within the military context is uh going to be done a lot more just, just as kb is doing it 
Yeah. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I was going to say, um, in tandem with the political and cultural climate of the world, we uh, technology is going to be a big factor in how technology changes, not only changes, but change how fast it changes. Um, and, you know, the prevalence of remote operated weapon systems, you know, right now you can have a drone operator sitting in an air conditioned trailer in New Mexico in a, you know, with his coffee in a comfy chair, controlling a drone flying over some other hard to reach corner of the world um, who could, you know, deal some pretty substantial damage with the push of a button. How is that going to play out in the psyche of future veterans of these kinds of conflicts? How is that going to advance as a technology? What happens when we have remote controlled tanks or, you know, remotely operated armored vehicles driving through densely, you know, occupied city spaces uh, and the implications of how that's going to affect not only the operators of that, but, you know, the, the climates in which those kind of actions are taking place. What kind of, you know, mental, emotional trauma will manifest, you know, PTSD didn't used to be called PTSD, uh, will it turn into something else now? And that's, that's going to happen. It's going to happen fast, right? Because technology is just like, you write something now you think is, is an advanced idea. And in 10 years, it's already outdated. So it'll be interesting to see, interesting and probably terrible to see where it really goes. Yeah, uh, Jack Jack mentioned Ukraine, um, and I don't know how many of you are following that. You know, what do we see in there that we think might show up in military sci-fi or is straight out of military sci-fi? You know what? I think there's two things. I want to touch really quick on what Zach said because I agree, and I think that I think that it it on an unfortunate scale provides us as authors with a really good opportunity to kind of delve into those issues and and talk more about the cost of war and the long-term cost of what happens when people go to war, which is is something that's sometimes touched on in military science fiction. And, and I think more so more recently um, versus the like, rah, rah, war is awesome. Let's go do this. Um, you know, you get that after um, like what happens after you're done. Who, you know, who, uh, who, what happens to the people who survive this? Because it's not just about the, you know, final scene with the dying sergeant. It's, it's about the, the rest of the crew when they have to go home and live with the, you know, what, what they saw and what they did. Um, but I would say definitely on the Ukraine front, um, I mean, that's a, like, David and Goliath story, right? Like, very very much um, holding your ground in your home country against an invading larger force who is supposedly more technically advanced and outmatches you in every, you know, aspect and, and just holding the line and being like, yeah, not today. You're not doing this today. Yeah. That's kind of a classic mill sci-fi story, like every invasion story, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, the one where the, where the White House gets blown up, uh, Independence Day. I mean, that, that's that's yeah, you know, yeah. I mean that that that's a military side. Craig's Craig's sci-fi is is a lot like that. Aliens, aliens come to work, Earth, and and guys are fighting them in Maine with with uh, shotguns out of their vans, um, and they get their right. But the, so Ukraine, I think, has showed us that right, so far the war has all been about logistics and numbers and indirect fires. It's not about maneuver warfare, and like in my books. I wanted to have ground combat and how can I justify ground combat when starships in orbit can, can wipe out the whole planet. And I, I basically had to back into it to say, well, a starship in orbit is vulnerable because it's flying low and slow. And if you avoid troop concentrations of more than, you know, platoon size, it's not worth jumping a starship into orbit to hit you. So in my books, basically, they do not concentrate force against an objective because if you concentrate your force, you're inviting an orbital strike. So it's all about small unit actions, special forces actions. And it's the only way I could justify having ground combat in an environment where, you know, starships control the high ground. 
Yeah. How much unrealistic stuff do we do? How much unrealistic yeah. stuff do we do in our books? Because that's what's cool. And we want to, that's what we want to write. You know, even though in reality, somebody probably just hacked that ship and now it's a brick. Yeah. 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 Or, or like Go ahead, in, Jack. Go in, ahead, Jack, Jack. Yeah, oh. in Jack's books, he has Black Jack Geary. The, the, the way that you've set up your technology is to restrict the way ships can fly and where they can fly. And that creates a choke point, And that's, that's dramatic. Otherwise, it's just ships firing each other randomly. I, that was that was brilliant. Thank. Um, yeah, I think one of the things Ukraine tells us is how hard it is to predict how everything's coming together. You remember going in before Ukraine, it was all uh, drones. Drones have made tanks obsolete. They've made tube artillery obsolete. You know, this stuff doesn't matter anymore. And what's uh, Ukraine screaming for? First, they wanted tube artillery. <laughs> get us all the stuff you can get. <laughs> and now they're screaming, we want tanks. We want big, heavy tanks. These things still matter. Um, so the drones matter, but the tanks do too. The legacy systems matter, and so does the latest bling. Um, and it, it comes down to this old, old lesson of combined arms. You know, no matter what your system is, if you don't have it integrated with other systems, you're going to end up like the Russians with your tanks getting picked off one by one. Um, so on the one hand, it's telling us that technologically, trying to figure out what's going to happen, things may well turn out to be a lot harder than we think. Dang, everything is. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, people are going to figure out how to do it and people are going to make mistakes. You know, it comes comes down to Clausewitz's thing. You know, it's all very simple in war, but all the simple stuff is really complicated. So, you know, all of this looks trying to figure out how to portray that in the future. That how are these new systems going to screw things up? That's I think one of the things we should be looking at. Uh, uh, what are the problems uh, they they could create? Uh, you know, in Stark's War, the big thing was how. Um, micromanagement through new command and control systems would just totally destroy a uh, officer corps uh, because they would not be used to they would never That's get the chance so to make real. a decision on the front yeah. um yeah i know that'll never happen um but uh it's just um yeah ukraine just shows us that uh boy it's going to be whatever the future is going to be it's probably not going to be what we expected <laughs> Yeah, I would suggest that anyone who thinks that a tank isn't useful has never been in the same room with a tank. Um, it, for, it, 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 that was mad. Uh, that is, uh, you know, it's always a good idea of, hey, we're going to go fight some tanks. And then you get there. And uh, yeah, the whole earth is shaking. And you're like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Um, Does anyone actually ever say, I want to go fight a tank? Oh, yeah. Infantrymen, sure. They'll tell you. They'll tell you. <laughs> we've got rocket launchers. We can. We can get in the right. trees, and they'll never get us. And then the tank runs the trees over. You yeah. Know? Uh, I mean, there is yes. Soldiers have egos. They will uh, do that. Right. Um, I just want one last follow up to this. Right. Um, does it take a different kind of soldier? You know, as you're changing, as you're changing. This is more of a modern warfare question, right? Than than a thing. But but as we're changing technologies, right. You know, as you're writing your futuristic weapons and they're all doing these things, right? The person in the drone, Zach talked about the, the drone operator who's sitting back there, right? Are, are we talking about a different kind of person than was, a, you know, a ground pounder in Vietnam? And where, where do those people come from? Kids who play awesome. video games, I guess, are being recruited. I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think Marines will always be Marines. You know, there's a certain type of person that yeah. you want to be a Marine. There's a certain type of person that you want to be a ground pounder. Uh, certain types of people are good at artillery, you know, with the engineering mindset, working the trajectories and everything. Um, I, I tend to think you, you alluded to this earlier that, uh, you know, if you've got senior non-coms from Caesar's Legion and Wellington's Army and right now and set them down together, they all be talking about the same thing and complaining about the same thing about their people. You know, kids these days, they've got it easy. They don't understand uh, how rough it was back in the old days. And uh, it's going to be different tomorrow. Uh, so um I think we've got the people here and I think they're going to be in many ways, the same kind of people, you know, pilots are going to be pilots uh, for better or worse. Uh, they, they think a certain way. 
engineers are going to be engineers. That's just uh, the, the, the exact task will vary, but I think they'll be the same people. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of like what defines or shapes what kind of people are fighting in these wars, be it soldiers, Marines, airmen, uh, you know, is the motivation for joining, right? The idea of patriotism and defend your country doesn't have the same ring that it did in the 1940s. Um, and now a lot of the motivations are coming from well, shit, I graduated at high school. What am I going to do now? I didn't take the SATs. I am not ready for college. I would never make it in there. Well, son, come join the Army or join the Marines, and we'll give you a, a cash bonus for joining. We'll pay for your college, it, and you get these benefits package that inspire you to join. So you're like, well, all right, I got nothing else. I'll do that. And a few months later, you could be in a, a combat zone overseas, um, and your reasons for being there are entirely selfish, I guess, uh, not to – oversimplify it but you know maybe some and now, now obviously there are outliers in varying degrees of this but that's uh you know a lot of the enticement that goes into joining the military is based on what can the military give me rather than you know than was it kennedy the you know what can i do for my country yeah i would i would say that there's something to be said like jack has a point about how you know, you're going to have people who are naturally inclined towards being pilots or mechanics or ground pounders or whatever. Um, but like Zach said, the, the way things have changed, especially in the last 20 years, uh, politically, socially, um, I think you're looking at a, a new uh, modern warfare force that is much more intelligent and much more willing to question uh, like, why are we doing this? You know, um, I mean, people Gen X and younger, they have friends all over the world because of the internet. And when you have friends all over the world, you're far less inclined to see them as other and see that, you know, we talk about Russia as being the big bad, but, you know, I have friends in Russia and I know that they don't necessarily agree with what their government is doing. Um, and so there's going to be some interesting conversations, and I think it's a worthwhile thing for authors of military science fiction to look at that, you know, that you should write a more nuanced story um, that's not necessarily like, here's the bad guy, here's the good guys, and there's no shades of gray, and there's no questionable actions on either side, um, that you should look at a little bit deeper and be a little more aware of the nuances that people can bring when you maybe know the other guy on the other side of the line and maybe you both don't want to fight each other and at what point do you say yeah we're not going to do this anymore i'm tired of dying for somebody else it's interesting to compare that with studies of the american civil war for example where they, these people had literally served together and they were fighting each other um, so if, if you want a, an insight into that, then you can certainly look back at those firsthand accounts, which I found fascinating. Um, and, uh, let's just say that having lived through the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, um, man, this stuff goes in cycles. There's always a new generation coming in that's saying, well, we're going to do things differently. Um, everything's always going to be, uh, very different in the future and somehow, <sighs> some things definitely do change. I mean, my God, when I first went on a ship, if you put a, you can't have girls on ships. Oh my God, they'll blow up. They'll sink. It's impossible. Um, you know, the idea of women in combat roles, just simply unacceptable. That stuff has changed, but other stuff. Yeah. It just comes and goes every, every uh, five, 10 years. You're going through another cycle of it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, in 2001, way. Yeah. Just just before 9-11, I was sitting in a room with a thousand majors, a right? thousand mid-grade officers and the general, the general who ran PR for the army was up in front of us. And the commercial had just come out for an army of one. OK, it was an army of one and everybody hated it. We all hated it. Right. And he goes, how many of you don't like the army of one campaign? And everyone raised their hand. He goes, good. It's not for you. 
we're recruiting 18 year olds, not 35 year olds, you know, and, and we, that was his answer. And it was, it was brilliant. And then we all shut up because, you know, it was, <laughs> because it was just, it was, it was, it was perfect. Um, let, let me, uh, let me jump into the business side of things for a minute, um, which, you know, we don't really like to talk about, but people who are watching really like to hear about sometimes. Um, and let's talk about, um, most military sci-fi these days. Let me just tell you, if I tried to put together two panels of traditional uh, military sci-fi authors who are being published traditionally today, it would be hard, right? I mean, if I dug into Bain, maybe I could, I could, I could make it happen. But if I was going to stick with the big five, I, most of us are here, right? Like, like most of us are on this panel, and uh, you know. And I'm going to throw this to Craig first as the as the uh, self pub uh, superstar of, of why. Why is so much military sci fi self pub these days, do you think? OK, so p part of it is uh, the cadence. So what the military side, I, I chose military sci fi first because it's my favorite genre. And if you want to sell books, you don't want your audience to be the, the person who buys one book a year on their summer vacation. You want somebody who buys 12 or 24 books a year. Though. Like women read romance, they read them voraciously. Uh, the military sci-fi reader is also a voracious reader. They, they read one book and they go on to the next, on to the next. And military sci-fi tends to, uh, the military sci-fi audience tends to like long running series where there are two or three books a year. So they don't, they don't get to a year later and forget you know, what happened to this story and what's going on with the characters. Traditional publishing can't do that cadence. I, I talked to Tor uh, about my new series and they wanted no more than one book a year and they wanted to be a small book, like 90,000 words. My books average twice that and I publish three a year. And I just think that the mil there's a lot of military sci-fi that is self-pub now. And it is, it's just the cadence. People want to crank out, you know, two or three books a year and they want to write whatever they, they feel like writing. And traditional publishing can't do that because they're all still focused on, you know, shelf space that that the book can't, the book can't occupy more than this space on a shelf, which is why it's limited to a certain number of pages. I mean, if you, you look at military sci-fi or romance and that is self-pub these days. It is not, I mean, there's plenty of romance that is traditionally published, um, but there's a lot more that is self-published right now. And that's where the market is going. That's where all the superstars in romance now is self-published. That's the, uh, you know, the women who are on, on book talk, you know, TikTok promoting themselves and, and military sci-fi is going the same way for that reason. It's just, it, it's just easier to write what you want. Whoops, other thoughts? Yeah, I think I, I agree with everything Craig said. It sound, all sounds right to me. I don't know that I'm like far enough into my career to like have a ton of insight into it, but I think you're right in that like, you know, I'm with Tor and the kind of general feel is like, you know, it's less about how many books a year and more about how long the series is because of that reader fall off mm -hmm. that like necessarily happens. Um, and I think that's not happening with, you know, indie public books but on the trad side that kind of thing is still happening and I think it's just a matter of them not catching up with <laughs> with kind of what's going on um, but there's also the situation of like you know how Michael mentioned in the beginning like my books aren't like fully military sci-fi they're kind of more a blend of genres so maybe the and I was kind of thinking about this a couple questions back to like what I would like to see out of the future of military sci-fi is that kind of blend with other subgenres of sci-fi and starting to kind of bring that into you know more of the mainstream by like peppering it into other stories where people are like oh you know i like space opera and it has some military that's fine and then you're kind of like getting them on board for that like military sci-fi subgenre so yeah my, my books have a lot of humor in them which is different from typical military sci-fi mm -hmm. um the, the self-publishing cadence also helps with the fall off that you know you publish a book and then they do a rapid release. You write three books and then release your first three books, you know, one month and then this, the fourth month and the, the sixth month. So people haven't forgot about you. So like mm -hmm. the people who read my first book in my series, 
about 67% of them go on to buy the second book. And then from then on, it's like 95% keep, keep going. Um, but part of that was I published the second book in the series four months after the first one. And then the next book came out four months after that. It's just, it's, it's, it's a different way of, yeah, out. and that's how Tor structured my first two books was they were four months apart. Um, and yeah. that was great, but they were only willing to, you know, take a chance on two books. So it's like now with the series continuing, it's like kind of like, okay, I got a, you know, hopscotch series sort of. So I've got this other book, which isn't necessarily a series. And that's where the other part comes in where it's like, I have very little control or knowledge of whether my books are going to become series. So it kind of limits how much you can think of like, your story on like a bigger scale when you're in trad pub jack yeah. you've uh, you've got some you've got some traditionally pub series that have run for for a significant number of books um you know is that something they wanted that you wanted some kind of combination um well um initially i was uh, the initial lost fleet series six books in it and they were only giving me two book contracts at a time on it um then they, they shifted to um trilogies and uh, um, longer contracts based on the, the sales. Um, <clears throat> I think a big part of it is um, with traditional publishers is that uh, Military SF is the um, most disreputable part of the disreputable science fiction genre, you know? <laughs> you, you don't get major literary awards for Military SF. Um, and so there's there's a certain uh, bias, really, in major publishers against it, um, uh, which is, certainly works to the advantage of those who want to uh, push the edges of it. But I remember when uh, uh, Lost Fleet could not uh, be sold for a long time, we couldn't find a British publisher. And the British publishers would all say, military science fiction doesn't sell over here. We don't sell any. And uh, my agent would say, you don't publish any. That's why you don't sell any. <laughs> that hurts. Uh, and then uh, they finally published some and, oh, it sold. Um, but, you know, it's uh, or like country music, you know, used to be. It's, oh, we don't really want to acknowledge that here. It's uh, it, it may sell a lot of copies, but uh, um, it's, it's uh, let's, let's let's put in something that's going to win an award, you know, literary award. So I think that's a factor in it, too. My well, UK like, publisher said exactly the same thing. Yes. And publishers, you know, um, it's like the guy said about Hollywood, that nobody knows anything. And, and talk to any publisher and they will tell you that science fantasy has been dead for decades. And that it's a genre which, which simply disappeared. And yet the biggest media properties these days are Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, both of which are textbook science fantasy. But to publishers, no, no, this won't sell. So you're, you're really dealing with um, interesting organizational dynamics there. All right. Uh, take, taking us back maybe to a little bit of, uh, of content in military uh, stuff, Zach, for you. Um, so you, you served. Um, and if anybody who's read Zach's book, uh, it is literally the most realistic military sci-fi book I've ever read to the point where it's almost not sci-fi, right? It's almost just a war book. Um, it's set in a future war. So it is sci-fi, but, but it feels like that first scene where, where the guy is in an airplane and they're getting ready to the land. I've literally been on that plane, like going into Baghdad. I was on that plane. It, you captured it. Perfect. It feels exactly like it happened. Right. Um, so um, is there? You think there's a balancing point of of the realism, and uh, you know what aspects you bring in and and don't bring in to to your your fictional work. Um, you know, is there a balancing point between trying to get the realism right, uh, get the story right, or anything you want to talk about with that? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that compliment. Um, yeah, there's definitely a wide spectrum, right? between the fantastic and the realistic and i guess it depends on what kind of story you want to tell or what you're trying to do where your story will lie on that spectrum um there's a big difference between gene roddenberry sci-fi and andy weir sci-fi not they're not military sci-fi but you get the point um for wake of war that was a very conscious effort to make it much closer to reality 
of course. Um, and like KB said with, with their book, uh, I wrote the draft for Wake of War in 2017 before things got as uh, as dicey as they did. And I didn't mean for it to be as prescient as it is, but I think it came out at a time where it's far more significant than if it had just come out at a different time. But I, it's a cautionary tale. And I knew that I wanted it to be a cautionary tale from the beginning. And in order to do that justice and to give it the weight that it needs to be taken seriously and to be, um, you know, to have substance and context and, and encourage whoever reads it to maybe put it down every once in a while and, and think of things uh, or even be cathartic for those who have like, like you Mike, have gone through that same gauntlet. Uh, I, I grounded it much more realistically to the point where it was, I wasn't even when, when my agent and I were talking about, it, I was like, I don't even know if this is sci-fi. Like how the hell, where, where does this lie? You know, that blending of genres, it's uh realistic near future war but it does take place in the near future and i am considering politics although i try to take the we were talking about earlier about the zoom level right what's what's um space opera or you know military sci-fi i zoom the book is very tightly focused on the people on the ground and the boots on the ground and their conflict because at that point when you're in the trenches the politics of what's going on somewhere else in the ivory towers you don't give a shit about them. You don't care. They don't matter to you because you're in the thick of it now and you got to do what you need to do to get through it. And you need the help of your crew and your team and your unit, just like they need the help from whoever's in it to get through. Um, so yeah, I, I, there was a review. I saw a review because even I accidentally, cause I definitely don't read my reviews. Um, <laughs> That said it was uh, Iraq in Utah. And I mean, I got, I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. You got me. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, because it's very, obviously very heavily inspired by my own experiences overseas or, you know, it's not an uh, autobiography with a veneer of, of fiction. Um, but, you know, a lot of the things that I've seen and, and witnessed and know of others who've gone through or one way or another been involved in definitely made it to the page and for me i mean i'm drawn to those stories that hurt sometimes because it writing wake of war was sort of a cathartic experience and i hope that for others it may be cathartic to read it to commiserate know that you know that's yeah you see something familiar and go i you know i've been through that too and it's through however obscure that connection is it's a connection with someone else you, you know particularly for for people who may be feeling like they don't have a connection with anyone. Um, and, you know, on the other side, maybe family members, um, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, friends who know someone who've served and don't really understand what their, that other person went through, you know, maybe they can glean a little bit of that through fiction. And I think that's the beauty of writing science fiction or writing in, in you know, genre fiction is that we can, imagine things that don't exist and and explore real life concepts through that so that was and that was my that was my goal i i, I hope i did it so yeah okay that's gonna be hard to follow uh the uh I, but i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this to jack jack you served at a different time uh in a, in a cold war in a cold war uh kind of kind of time um you know what is uh what elements of military service do you pull into your books you know how, how did you pull that service into your books and for everyone else i'm going to follow up right after that with how do you pull things from your life or things from if you didn't serve where do you get that stuff from because you all do it you all did it i don't know how you did it you brought real but your books feel real right so you brought it in from somewhere so i'm going to come to you after that but i'm going to start with jack well the the direct mechanics stuff i mean uh driving ships taught me relative motion i was i'm able to describe and visualize three-dimensional battles in space because i understand relative motion somebody asked me if i had maps of it and i said no i don't know how i would make a map of this i just know how it works you use aviator hands you know to <laughs> work it out um uh, experience making command decisions that sort of thing uh 
as I, I mentioned in, in an earlier message, uh, learning that the two most dangerous things in the universe are a general officer with a great idea and a bored Marine. Um, but um, a, a lot of it is what, what Zach said of trying to, for those who served, trying to show, yeah, I get it. Here's what it is. Here's somebody who understands and was there. Um, and for those who didn't serve, trying to get across, yeah, it's not this thing you see in the comics and the cartoons. This is what it really feels like to people, trying to convey that. The one universal thing I've seen when dealing with civilians is I have to tone down the reality of the military because you describe actual incidents and civilians will say, nobody would ever be that stupid. I got um, you, you never, <laughs> that would never happen. It's, it did. I was there. I, yeah, um, I got a review. I got a review that said that would never happen on a military base. And I'm like, dude, I just filed the serial numbers off that. That was real. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, you have to try and get across to civilians that Catch-22 was not a satire. It was a documentary. Um, and the military gets things done not because it's a super efficient, super capable organization, but because it's got people who somehow get things done despite the military. Um so that's probably the biggest challenge I faced in uh, in uh, converting my experience to a larger audience. Okay, so to people who didn't serve, how, where do you where do you get that realism from? What do you bring in from your life or from your experiences that that make that that so real? I mean, I I worked as a military contractor for basically my entire career, other than what I'm doing now. And military contractors tend to hire a lot of veterans and you engage with active duty military, um, you know, a lot of mid-grade officers who were, you know, running contracts. Um, and I just, you know, listened to them. You know, God gave me one mouth and two ears and, you know, listen to how people speak. Yeah. So okay. for me, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier about, you know, my experience on film sets. I didn't really realize till after I wrote The Last Watch that I kind of transposed some of that experience into that situation. But, um, you know, it's a matter of putting like mostly competent people in a room together to get something done and like pushing against like like the boundaries of what they're comfortable with. So, you know, they have a specific job, but, you know, the universe is ending. So everybody's got to do a different thing. And like showing how competent people can get things done. And that's kind of was my experience on set where it's like, you know, despite whoever it would be like the producer or the director or someone who is just fighting you for whatever reason, you know, the camera crew is still going to get it done or the lighting crew is still going to get it done. Like, and finding those like ways to work around the like difficult personalities and things like that. And I think I ended up kind of accidentally bringing a lot of that into my writing. Yeah, for me, it helps also that a bunch of my beta readers are veterans, so they will, they'll check me on certain things I wrote that's wrong. Go ahead, Kibby. Yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I have been infinitely lucky um, in my life in terms of the, the number of people who are surrounded. I, so I'm not, I haven't ever served, but I've spent a great deal of my life around the military. Um, my partner was in the Air Force for 12 years. I have a, like, just a wealth of information of friends and people who are willing to like talk to me and, and sit down and, and share all that stuff. Um, and then just living, living in that environment, you tend to like sort of absorb a lot of it, even when you're, you know, when you're a military spouse, you often like get all of that stuff just by osmosis. Um, and you, you know, yeah, like, like Craig said, you listen to the stories and you, you know, and you ask questions as applicable but so yeah i've had, i've been really lucky and i've had a lot of friends willing to be like you know no tell this story <laughs> i'm like okay here we go like yeah or put you know you got to put the crayon joke in because if you don't if you don't he's <laughs> a marine about eating crayons then is it really a marine um and stuff like that so it's just you know you and then you you sort of twist it uh you know to like when you're talking about realism versus what is going to make an entertaining story, um, you're definitely looking to walk a balance line between 
wanting enough realism so that people who are in the military or who have been aren't like, well, that's bullshit. Um, but people who aren't or have never even had that association with the military aren't completely lost. Um, you know, so you don't, you, if you throw acronyms in, you, you always need to make sure that you're like explaining them at some point. Um, although I tend to, I think, annoy my copy editors a lot because sometimes I'm like, no, you know what? That's an inside joke. And the people who get it will get it. And the people who don't, there's Google. They can look it up if they want. Yeah, Just I, make I sure have, I've had a, make sure yeah. your audio narrator knows it's an acronym and doesn't pronounce it as D F A C. I actually, for my last one, um, I had the the narrator who who did she did wear the crawdad saying never had done a military book in her life. And I wrote out every acronym in my book and how you specifically say it just so that wouldn't mm -hmm. happen. And I actually remember it from you having that problem with one of your early books with DFAG. And that's why yeah. I did it. I wrote that list out for um, one of the <laughs> things that I get is, is um, you know, is civilians usually reading or even military people reading a character wrong. Like Carl Butler is this hard drinking, you know, colonel in the army and uh you know he's doing this investigation and he's he drinks a lot and, and and people talk about him like he's a man's man he's he's you know he's a hard drinker hard worker i'm like no he's got untreated pdsd and he's an alcoholic because of yeah it, you know i mean it, but and it just resonates in different ways with different people because those are real people because i i know a lot of guys like that right um you know because Colonels don't go get treatment for their PTSD. They just treat it them because it's not really a problem. That that yeah, attitude is changing, drink. changing some, but it's uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Craig. They drink and get divorced, like Carl Butler. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, he gets divorced at the beginning of the book too, and people wonder, well, why did you do that? Well, the real reason is there was no room for his wife in the story, and I had to get rid of her. I mean, she just yeah. was in the way because he wouldn't have left. You know, if he was happily married, he wouldn't have left. So, so he got divorced so that he could go on an adventure. Um, yeah, but I don't share that very often. Now it's on YouTube forever. Well, it's in, <laughs> at least at least you chose divorce and not like found in a refrigerator. Right. Yeah, I don't. I, I hate that, that trope. I just hate that trope. No. Right. Um, and she was never even on the screen in in, in book one. So she was no. more of a concept because he was deployed. Okay, let me throw this one out there. This is a big one. This is a big, big philosophical one. Right. War is bad. Okay. And we all write about it. How do you make it okay? How do you make heroes in a place where, the, you know. There aren't any like everybody's a bad guy, right? Everybody's a bad guy in certain certain conflicts. Um, everybody's a good guy. Depends on which side you're looking at it from. Right. Um, you know, and in the modern in the modern parlance. OK. And, and in the 60s, we would just write about it and we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. And that's how we would write about it. I think. As KB mentioned earlier, we have friends all over the world now. There's a, a there's a much broader world view of. Hey, the jingoism is not, it's accepted certainly by, by a group of people, um, but it's not universally acceptable to, to do that kind of thing anymore, right? So how do you get past the fact that you're writing about something that is objectively bad and then create people that your readers want to root for? And so in my books, my main character goes from fighting in Nigeria, a war that's like, it's just one tribe against each other. What the hell are we doing here? It's an optional war to fighting a war for survival. And they don't have a choice. It's the survival of humanity or the death of humanity. So. Yeah, you do this. So you, you, murder. you do the reverse colonialism. You do, you do the, yeah, you, yeah. We're, 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 we're the little guy, the big guys are coming in. We're the Ukraine and, and Russia is coming in from outer space and, and they do that. Right. Okay. That's one yeah, way. Yeah. That's great. Go ahead. So, so basically I, I I'm cheating that my main character doesn't have any moral dilemma. It is survival. Yeah. And, and, we're, and we're the underdog. And if, if they don't fight, then humanity is enslaved or dead. So I, I basically cheat. I don't have to, to worry about that. Okay. I think it's a matter of perspective, right? No one, no matter how heinous their actions or beliefs ever believe themselves to be the villain 
right? Um, that's not to say that there aren't things that the reader could see right through. You could be trying to just, you know, maybe you're in the head of a, a villainous character trying to justify some terrible acts, but there's a balance. And if you're, if you do your characterization, right. And you make the character believable and sympathetic, right. Give them human flaws and human traits and trials and troubles that we all have in real life. And then if the character believes in what they're doing, or even if they don't believe in what they're doing, but they find a way to convince themselves that it's what they must do, then I think the reader can latch on to that as well. Um, this is something, uh, sh I mean, shameless self plug here, but Wake of War was very specifically, uh, I wrote it in this way. It's about a civil war and it follows a story of a young soldier fighting for the government and a young rebel fighting for the freedom movement and both are main characters. And I had to write them both as sympathetic characters, right? A soldier is shooting, uh, you know, civilians and a civilian is shooting soldiers and police officers and things. It's just, it's, it's tough stuff. Uh, and it was very difficult to try to make them sympathetic. But in the end, each one of those characters has a reason for being involved in the conflict. Um, and e whether they believe in it or they convince themselves eventually that it's something they need to do, whatever it is, but it, you have to be in their head and you have to make them believable and fallible human beings. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, I, def I definitely think that um, it, when you bring it back to the characters themselves, um, it, it gives you the ability to kind of walk that middle road and and focus on stuff that's that's maybe a little bit less, you know, war is great and, and much more introspective. Um, I, you know, I the way we designed the Neo G uh, world um, like one of the things we set out first was that we weren't going to do a war. We weren't going to do some big world ending conflict. You know, we weren't going to do aliens. Um, and that basically sort of set the rules of engagement for us in terms of how, uh, how we were going to deal with some of this. And what we ended up with is since the Coast Guard is in essence a police force, um, you know, now I'm writing books about a space police force um, in an era where, let's be honest, cops aren't necessarily the best thing. Um, wow, I was super polite about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're on my Twitter, you know my actual opinions. Um, so I, I do a lot of work and there's a lot of interrogation among them and like among the characters themselves in terms of what what work they're doing and what what is the work worth um and they're also it's it's very much a different force it's 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 much more focused on helping people um it's much more focused on finding non-lethal alternatives to doing this um you know there's there's a lot of discussion about therapy and going to rehab and um doing things that aren't necessarily punitive um corporal punishment type of things um though those things still exist in the world because i'm not writing a utopia and i don't think that it's something we can remove entirely um but yeah so for my part like that's where the focus is generally and so it's it's this acknowledgement that yeah like war is is not a great thing and it's it's something that essentially destroyed the world and everybody's still very aware of that even though we're 400 years post collapse Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. You, uh, you, you kind of uh, in Rubicon, which nobody else has read who's watching this right now, but I have, and it's great. And you kind of take a classic sci-fi way around some of this conundrum. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So I was actually thinking more about my other series, like first. Um, so the Divide series is kind of interesting in that you know there isn't an active conflict happening. You know, there it's just about this unit that is stationed in a specific place, and natural. You know, the universe collapses. It's awful. They're they're dealing with it, etc. But spoiler alert: the series continues, and there's kind of a you know, the inklings of a rebellion, and a lot of what the series is about is like how can we fix the problems that we're coming up against and the bad guy of the story without like having another war because. 
they've come off a war, you know, there's, I think it was like five years ago is when it ended. So they talk about it a lot, but that we don't actually see that stuff happening and it impacts the plot a lot. And, you know, the characters are dealing with it. And a lot of that for me is like bringing out that nuance of like, you know, did these people have really a choice in enlisting? Like Zach had mentioned previously, where it's like, they're kind of, you know, you get recruited right out of, you know, your bad situation into this and it's all, you know, and, you know, the characters are kind of, dealing with that so that's where some of that nuance comes um rubicon on the other hand like michael mentioned <laughs> is um very different in that they're like in the middle of an active war um i kind of specifically framed it in that they are um it's robots so you know they're not killing humans at least so that part of it <laughs> is kind of like to the side but how the military is treating its soldiers is kind of the main like issue and crux of the book and you know there's a lot of um internal struggles that the main protagonist had the only protagonist has um as far as like how like why did she even get into this how did she get into this place how can she get out of it you know that's kind of the the main impetus of her character arc is like trying to avoid this unending war situation so it's you know it's a lot about framing you know who's the bad guy who's the good guy you don't know but I think if you get into the nuance if it's a character driven story then you're gonna start to understand those perspectives and I think that's where military sci-fi really shines is that you can kind of you know get people to under see something from someone else's point of view um I think um a big part of it is trying to get inside people as, as was said, motivations, why are you doing this? Uh, why are the people on the other side doing what they're doing? Because, yeah, they probably do think they're doing the right thing. Um, showing that, yeah, there really are some psychopaths on both sides. And uh, the questions. Uh, it's often, I think, in, in my stories, uh, confronted in terms of obedience to orders. Characters who, okay, you've got orders, do this. And... Okay, are these legal orders? Do I push back against this? Um, if it is a legal order, is there a way I can do this and still maintain my sense of self? Um, or are you going to have a character who, um, uh, as it me, lie when uh, uh, soldiers are massacring civilians? The guy who landed his helicopter between the civilians and the soldiers and stood out and said, hey, you're going to have to go through me to get to them. Uh, are you going to have that kind of character who says... Uh, um, this, this is uh, a totally immoral situation, but I'm still going to maintain my morality inside and try to maintain some sense of right and wrong. Uh, I think that's that's the big key to it, is, is trying to get inside the heads of the people and showing why they're doing what they're doing, even if it's mistaken, in your opinion, that they have a reason why they're doing this. Maybe it's so they'll get promoted, but maybe it's because they really think this is their only option. And um, so that, you know, humanizing everybody. Um, And when in my books they encounter aliens, that's one of the biggest challenges. Why are they doing this? Because they're not people. They're not doing it for human reasons. They're doing it for reasons that make sense to them. But what are they? (laughs) Because we have no idea. Um, So that, I think, is the key to try to deal with the, the, the horrible situation. Don't sugarcoat it. Uh, show instead that this is where people face their ultimate moral test of what they're willing to do and what it is they're they're willing to kill for, literally. All right. Thank you all. I am going to wrap us up now. That went fast. The uh, That was great. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, I do want to give each of you a chance to say goodbye and tell us where we can find you on social media. Tell us where you're appearing next. Tell us when your next book is coming out. Zach mentioned a shameless plug for his book. There is no such thing. It's not it, it, <laughs> just buy in. You, if you, you, that's why we're here. Um, you got to plug your books um, because, uh, well, that's what we do, right? And I'm going to start on the bottom left. So I'm going to start with uh, Jenny, and we will go around from there. Yeah, so you can find me on all socials at JSDewis, so J-S-D-E-W-E-S, um, and my website is the same. 
And then my books are wherever books are sold, um, paperback, ebook, audiobook. The Last Watch is the first in the series. I recommend starting there. And then my um, next novel, Rubicon, I have one precious copy of it, um, <laughs> will be coming out March 28th. And I will be doing a reading of this um, at TBR Con on Sunday at, I think, 8 p.m. Eastern. You should go watch a reading. It is a fantastic book. I really like it. Craig, go ahead. Oh, um, you can find me on craigallinson.com, which is real easy. Um, I want to plug somebody else's book. Michael. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm actually going to be with Michael at uh, Sega Writers Conference in Winston-Salem in March. So Michael and I will begin together then. All right. Go ahead, Zach. Hi. Um, you can find me at zachtopping.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, Z-A-C-T-O-P-P-I-N-G, Zach Topping. Um, I'm on them somewhat sporadically, but I'm there. Uh, Wake of War is available everywhere in hardcover, audiobook. Uh, the paperback comes out in June. As for my next book, it is coming. It's in the works. I don't know that I'm at liberty to discuss it yet. It's uh, still classified information, but it's coming. So stay tuned to find out more. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all again. Thanks for having me. Jack? Uh, you can uh, find me um, social media. The most common place is there's a uh, Fans of the Lost Fleet series on Facebook group. Um, and uh, we don't just talk about Lost Fleet, but anything that uh, I've written uh, and other things. Uh, and also my website, jack-campbell.com. Uh, my next book out will be Implacable, which is the 21st, I think, book in the six, original six book Lost Fleet series. Uh, and it's coming out on the 4th of July. Just a coincidence. I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> And after that, I've got a, a, a new two book series, which is, is going to be coming out, which is more space opera than uh, um, military SF, I think. More like uh, the sort of thing Andre Norton would be writing if she was writing today. Uh, but we'll see. Are you making any appearances this year, Jack? Are you going to a convention? Um, or? Yeah, I'll be at Balticon in Baltimore, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I will be a guest at Dragon Con again. So I'll be there in Atlanta. Um, and then uh, the only other one I'm certain of at this point is Cap Clave in uh, Rockville, Maryland in um, October. All right. Okay. KB? Well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us this evening. And thanks, Mike, for wrangling us because I know that's like wrangling cats or lieutenants. Uh, I can be found at kbwagers.com um, since the social media sphere is so wild right now. All of my social media information is on the website. Um, although I will be writing Twitter down into the flaming wreck that it potentially can become. Um, my next Neo G book comes out in June. It is called The Ghosts of Trappist. And um, if you like pirates and AIs and ghost ships in space, then uh, that is something you want to check out. You do not have to read the first two Neo G books in order to understand anything that's going on in this one. But um, if you would like to uh, help keep my cats fed, um, then you can also purchase those. Uh, and I additionally have two finished trilogies out from Orbit Books. If you like space opera of the, what if Han Solo was a woman who went smuggling and then got dragged back home to run an empire variety. And that is um, the Andronan War and the Farian War trilogies featuring the gunrunner turned empress Hale Bristol. All right. Thank you. And I am uh, Michael Mame. Uh, you can find me on all social media at Michael Mame. If you Google me, I, I have, I'm an SEO dream. Uh, there, there is only one other Michael Mame in America and he bought my book. So he, you only, <laughs> only I come up. I won the duel for the name. Uh, and so you will find me everywhere as that. My latest book came out a week ago today. And it's called The Weight of Command, and it is available uh, right now only on Amazon um, because it came out as an Audible original, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out how to make that work in the world. Um, 
but it came out a week ago today and it's on sale paperback, hardback, ebook, and uh, the audiobook's been out on Audible for a while, but only on Audible because, well, let's be real, because that's what they paid me for. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, anybody who's watching. I appreciate you all uh, spending your time with us today. And if you're watching this in the future, it's actually sci-fi because we're talking to you from the past. Thanks so much <laughs> and uh, have a great day. Thank you.